evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to get started. You can have your attention, please. Can you hear that all right? Can you hear that? Is that volume okay in the back? Can you hear me? My name is Dan Spinner. I'm the CEO of the West Shore Chamber of Commerce. We're happy to host this evening. Um, I can claim to have been a former resident of Mechosin, for which uh, some of the candidates are still mad at me for moving out to East Sioux. But anyway, um, we've done these in all municipalities except for Highlands, which of course was a claim. And we do them uh, the last 15 years, every five, actually, five years of cycles. We think it's really important. It's not, we're not here to present a chamber point of view. We're simply here to facilitate your dialogue and your exchange with all the candidates. We have the process we're going to go through tonight. I'm going to introduce you to our moderator. The moderator is Mr. Stephen Whip. Stephen is our vice president, incoming president of the chamber. Um, and he'll explain to you what the process is tonight and how we'd like to see the evening go. Thanks, Dan. Am I okay not to use this mic? Yeah. 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 Okay. So I'm going to take it down here because this is where we're going to start now. So welcome and thank you for coming. You know, it's a great thrill for me to be part of something like this because for years, I've lived out here for 20 odd years in Colwood. And then I went to the dark side, as my friend said, because we moved into Langford. You know? But we try our best, right? Um, I've been involved out here for a number of years. Some of you have had children probably who went to Westmont School. I was a board chair there for a number of years. And throughout this 20 years, it's exciting for me to always come back to my chosen because people here take it seriously. And the quality of candidates that you often get here are far above what they will get anywhere else. And I think most of you would agree if you looked around in some of the other municipalities and the quality of candidates that are there, these guys all here could easily fill those shoes, be heads and shoulders above them. So you have a tough choice in a couple of days. And I understand that you've had other debates, other, other opportunities to hear what your what the candidates feel about the issues, and that's great. What we want to do tonight is make sure you walk out of here and go, I finally know what they're saying. It's not gobbledygook finally nailed them down, and I know how I'm going to vote. So that's always a good test, I think, for all of us when we go to these. So I would encourage you to take part. The way we're going to do this is that each candidate for mayor is going to get three-minute opening comments. Those running for a council seat will get two minutes. And then we have a number of questions that many of you have sent into the Chamber website. And we're going, there's two of those questions we felt were, were sort of very motherhood vision statements of what the people believe about Machosen. And each councillor and each mayor candidate is going to get an opportunity to answer those. And then for the remaining questions that were sent to the website, we're going to break them down so that each council person and each <coughs> future council person and each person running for mayor will get an opportunity to, a to answer one question. Twice. So there'll be two questions to each of those people. Following that, there's two other ways that we'd like you to participate tonight if you can. One is we're going to circulate little green cards, or are they yellow tonight? They're white tonight. They're white tonight, okay. They're white tonight. So for those people who do not want to come up to the mic and ask a question, you can jot down the questions and we'll make sure those questions get asked. If you're brave enough to get up to the mic, by all means get up there and go away, and that, or go away, go away after you ask the question. What we don't want is a political statement beforehand, you know, those long preambles, and certainly, you know, I know what that is because as an old environmental activist, I used to go on for 10 minutes before you got to the question, so those are always the fun ones. But for the sake of time and respect to others, we'd like to get right to the question right away. So if you don't, I'll be there just to nudge a little bit. So, uh, videos and, and then, yes. So in terms of videos, we're videotaping everything. So if you do not want your face, your voice, to be videotaped, please let us know. And so the camera won't be swung around to you when you're asking questions. And what about the audio? What happens with the audio again? Same thing. Same thing. It's connected to the video. And it will be on our website, uh, thanks to Jason, tomorrow morning. And by the way, let me introduce Jason to you. Jason is a volunteer from the community um, who's 
containing many of the volcanic trees throughout Greater Victoria on his own time and his own expense. Give him a hand. I think that's it. Good evening, everyone. It's uh, nice to be back here again. And it's good to see everybody turn out. I was kind of wondering whether we would have much of a turnout. And once again, uh, you make me proud to be part of this community and I see the interest that we have. For those that don't know me, I'm, um, I was born and raised in this community. Uh, it was a great place to grow up as a kid. This whole place was like a, a playground to us. In turn, my wife and I raised four children here. They got to do the same things that, that I got to do. Well, I hope not all of the same things that I did, but um, the, it's such a, a special place, this community. And there isn't a, a day goes by that at some point in it, I don't look around and think, man, am I ever lucky to live here? And that's, that's what's motivated me over the 18 years that I've spent on council. I, I passionately believe in what we're doing here. Uh, and in fact, uh, unlike Ed, I even like the mayor here. So. <laughs> <laughs> but something, uh, something different happened in the last three years or so, and that is that uh, it's, it's no longer just a belief. It's, it's, we're actually being able to prove that what we're doing is the best way. There's information coming in now that, and you can look at my website, or I mean, you can, there's, there's lots of it coming in now that would indicate that Machosen is probably in as good shape as any municipality in the province, both from a fiscal perspective and from an infrastructure perspective. And that's because we've been able to do things that no one else has been able to do. There's always been this sort of dichotomy of, of opinion where Oh, you have to broaden the tax base. You're even going to hear that tonight. You've got to broaden the tax base. We've been hearing that for 27 years here. The proof now is that those that have are in financial trouble, and those like the Highlands and ourselves that haven't aren't. And we're good for as many years as we want to be. We have the resiliency to be able to survive recession. We have the ability to be able to preserve our lifestyle for as long as we want it, as long as we can keep on the, the course that we're doing. That's what's at stake in this election, is being able to stay the course we're doing. I'm asking you to return us for three more years so we can improve our infrastructure, continue to force so we can complete our infrastructure improvement, and, and so that we can continue to develop the innovative things that we're doing here. I genuinely believe that we can be example. I mean, we're already being used as an example by the province for sound fiscal management, but I believe that we can be an example for others like us right across the country of how to preserve our lifestyle and how to operate a municipality for sus sustainability in the long-term future. And uh, in fact, I mean, I, I commit to that. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ed Cooper. I'm a long-time resident of the Chosen in business. And what I got to say tonight, and you will notice on my brochure, there are a lot of numbers, financial numbers. These numbers have been acquired through the district office by formal request by me to get the correct numbers. They come from staff. So if there's any disagreement with these numbers, it's the staff that hands them up. So Ed, Ed hold the mic uh, closer, dear. I'll start off by saying good evening, everyone. I will start by letting you know that I am Ed Cooper, a longtime resident of the District of the Chosen. The reason I am asking you to elect me as your mayor is 
I believe I can do a better job than the current mayor and council. I believe they do not have a problem spending other people's money. If I am your mayor, I will be watching your money closely. This mayor and council today have spent $100,326 on equipment for a workshop and a whopping $242,296 on capital costs of the building and yard for a grand total of $342,622, numbers from the office. In my opinion, this is outrageous. And to see our mayor and support the, and council support this is beyond words. If this keeps up, we will have to win the lotto to pay our taxes. Please think about what I told you tonight. Thanks for listening, and it's your money I'm talking about. It's time for change. Vote Ed Cooper for mayor. Thank you very much for listening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and fellow candidates for my chosen council. I am Terry Wilson, and I want to represent you on council. I would like to thank the West Shore Chamber of Commerce for this opportunity to address all here. I have stated before that the chosen cannot survive and prosper on residential and farm taxes alone, and still maintain its chosen path. On receiving most of the incumbent flyers in the mail, the one item that was very evident in each was their fiscal responsibility during their last term. With this council's continuous statements regarding their great record for fiscal responsibility, why, in a recent A Channel News item, actually a presentation by the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, was the chosen second only to suit on the lower island for highest spending per capita. From 2000 to 2009, the population growth was 1% in Machosa, with 111% spent per capita. That's high. What would that percentage be if 2010 and 2011 were added in? It all comes down to spending tax dollars wisely and getting the biggest bang for our buck or find new sources of income. As stated in the presentation, people only have so much ability to pay, but you do have a vote this Saturday. As been chosen endeavors to move forward and maintain pace with the requirements of residents, sound and productive planning will require adaptation and implementation. It is time for openness and transparency in the council chambers. My opinion is personal agendas like muddy boots should not be worn into the municipal hall. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for coming out in this inclement weather, but we should be thankful that it's not snowing like it is up island. Anyways, my name is Karen Watson. I have served on the chosen council in the past for 13 years, seven years as councillor, six years as mayor, including six years on the CRD board, of which two of those years I was vice chair of the board. I would like to have you support me in this election because I'm very concerned about the finances of the chosen. When I was last in office, the projections were a 0% tax increase in 2008. Now it's a 20% tax increase by 2014. The 2008 projections also included the cost of policing, maintaining service levels, and that 20% increase that's projected for 2014 includes 14.3% for policing, plus the 5% that you're currently paying on your individual taxes right now, as a line item, the uh, bill is $104.16 for the average homeowner. 
I find this very unacceptable and I would like to have your support to vote me back onto council so that I can be your financial watchdog and ensure that we are getting the best value for our tax dollars. I've lived in Machosen for 32 years. We raised our family here. And strangely enough, I, I, I'm always surprised when people say, we don't want Machosen to change. We want it to be rural. We want this, we want that. Well, when I moved here 32 years ago, I had a dirt road. I was lucky to have electricity because the people further up the road did not have electricity. I had to take the, the little ones in the stroller down the bumpy road and knock on the few neighbors' doors to see if they had children so that they could have someone to play with. And when I looked out my window across at Glen Forest, you could barely see any houses. And that has changed, but that has, has that degraded our life? No, because those changes are those which were allowed within the OCP and the land use bylaw, of which I firmly believe in. So on Saturday, please, I ask for your support to elect me back onto council. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome this evening. I'd like to thank the West Shore Chamber of Commerce and the Goldstream News for hosting tonight, and especially thank the staff of, uh, of the West Shore Chamber. I've been privileged to be the council liaise for the last three years, and I've seen the membership climb uh, to, I think, about 550 today, so kudos to you people. My name is Larry Trombley. I've been a councillor in Machosen now for three years. <clears throat> During those years, I've endeavoured to be clear about where I stand on the different issues. The main thing I've tried to do is make decisions that are benefit all of Machosen and not any individual or any group. I support families. I believe that the young in this municipality have to be looked after and the seniors in the same vein. They built this country and they deserve to have a lifestyle where they can stay in their community. We're going to be making an important decision on Saturday regarding detached secondary suites. And I have faith in the residents of Machosen that uh, you're quite capable of making a decision based on fiction. Fact, not fiction, I'm sorry. I think we're on the right track on the works yard. It's Proven last winter, we went through a rough winter, we completed every task that we had, and I'm sure the young people that are going to be doing those roads this year will, uh, you won't have any complaints. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming out on such an awful evening. I'm Jo Mitchell, and I have been on council for six years. Over the past six years, I have greatly appreciated working with many of the chosen residents. Together, we have accomplished a lot, but we have a lot more to do, and that's why I'm running for the third term as councillor. Let me list just a few of the issues which residents have told me are important and that I support. Firstly, Machosen needs to be a community for all ages. To support this goal, I convince council to re-establish the Healthy Communities Advisory Committee is sitting here tonight. The volunteers on this active aging subcommittee are doing wonderful work in defining ways to help seniors remain in their, their homes as long as possible. I'd like to support the action steps developed by this committee and the newly formed youth committee. Second, supporting viable agriculture this second, is essential to maintaining the chosen's rural status. To achieve this goal, I convinced Council to establish the Agricultural Advisory Committee to support our local farmers. Third, our new works yard. Another of my instigations, Ed doesn't like it, uh, has made preparations for winter so much easier now that we can safely and environmentally hold quantities of salt and sand ready for whatever nature may throw at us. Our equipment is in excellent condition, all achieved within the amount of the highway's contracted budget. We are now on a two-year trial program to see if we can avoid going out to tender, where we are legally obliged to accept the lowest bid, irrespective of the suitability of the bidder to the chosen special needs. 
Four, I've been working to establish the Machosan Arts and Cultural Center. Oops. Most recently, raising funds for its new gallery in the old Machosan School Library. Instead of a derelict building in the middle of the village core, we have a vibrant facility that is attracting positive attention. Finally, I seek your support to continue on a council which has low taxes, no debt, a healthy reserve, and which, in spite of differing opinions, works together for the benefit of a rural Machosa. Thank you. Thank you all for caring enough to come to the community here in the hall and to attend and to thank you to Eshore for hosting this. I'd love to be up here telling you what an awesome person I am and what a rabid environmentalist I am and uh, all the good things I've done, but um, you'll have to read my mail out for that. Because I want to counter some of the misleading statements that have been coming out about our finances. First, let me assure you the district's finances are in excellent condition, probably the best in the whole province. We're doing really well, we have money in the bank, we don't owe any money, and we're looking at our, after our infrastructure deficit. We have the lowest residential tax rate in the CRD. Karen and Ed are worried about tax increases, which is surprising, because during Karen's six years as mayor, taxes increased by a whopping 33%. Well, in the last six years, they've increased by 13. Yes, there will be municipal tax increases if our population goes over 5,000 and we have to pay for uh, police costs. That's true. But what you and the other candidates should know is that it will have very little effect on your overall tax bill. An average taxpayer here already pays the province $120 a year police tax. If the population goes over 5,000, that money, the municipality will collect that money directly. Think of it like your two children going to university. One goes to UVic and one goes to SFU. You pay 100 bucks for each of them to go and for their tuition. The next year, they both go to UVic, so you pay nothing to SFU, and you pay 200% now to UVic, but it's the same amount of money. So that's kind of a simple version of what's going to be happening on your tax bill. So please don't worry about it. We also have a million dollars in reserve to help with any transition costs. Please ask me questions about CFIB when you get a chance, because I have a long explanation about that too. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you to my colleagues at the Chamber for putting this on. And I'd like to thank the, the candidates that are here. Uh, we're all here because we have a passion for the community we live in. That, no matter what any, anything is said or anything that we put out in our, our literature, I believe to be true. I'm here, I'm, I'm 33, I have spent more than half my life here in Machosan, and I have spent uh, more than half of my life in public service. I first was elected to council when I was 21, uh, a very exhilarating experience, let me tell you. And uh, I spent nine years doing that, which I absolutely loved, although there were low points as well as high points. And the last three years, I've had the pleasure of working with the Chamber, and we have transformed the Chamber not just to be the voice of business, but to be the voice of community connected with business. We understood that in order to have a strong, uh, vibrant community, you needed to have the supports in place so that business could turn around and support the community endeavor, endeavors that were happening. My passion is my chosen. I want to be at the council table because I love where I live. I love the opportunities I have had growing up here and I want my two boys, which are being raised in this beautiful environment to experience everything I did as a child and everything that they are currently experiencing now. I want that to continue. They have a right to see the beauty that we have here just as the rest of us have a right to age in place, to grow our families, to have grandkids come and visit us, to have kids have playdates, to be able to see what we have here and how special it is. So on Saturday, in three more sleeps, as I tell my boys, I would ask for your support so that I can come back to the council table and continue to serve you and my community with the passion that I have for it. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for the opportunity and for being here tonight.
I'm Bob Benigna, and I'm seeking my fourth term as your counselor. It's been a pleasure to be on this present council that has been so positive. We've accomplished a great deal. I'm your planning and zoning and public hearings chair. The first thing this council set out was the OCP review. First of all, we said it was an excellent document, but there were two areas that needed addressing. The first one was the village center review. I led council in a public consultation process that established an arts and culture vision with the ability to entertain other innovative ideas. The other final uh, important outcome was Councillor Mitchell conceding her roundabout but taking victory on autumn colors. Secondly, as promised, this council has dealt with the secondary suite issue. We asked you if you wanted a referendum on the question. Your response led to council coming up with a consensus-based question we all could agree on and can direct the next council. We've abided by our subdivision servicing bylaw, soil deposit bylaw, and tree bylaws, and have actually persuaded compliance, but when necessary, moved to enforcement. As a veteran counselor, I can help council continue to make thoughtful decisions on challenging land use and other issues. Thank you, and on Saturday, please uh, join uh, my wife Donna in support. What a great town for Unfortunately, uh, Danny has not shown up. Um, she has confirmed that this is Danny Hogan, Morgan, who had confirmed that she was going to be here this evening. I'm not sure what, what has happened. Hopefully, it's nothing bad. So, what we'll do is pr proceed without her until she does show up. And if, when she does, she can join us at the table. So we may have to change up what I previously said earlier. We'll figure that out. So we have two questions that we're going to ask each person. Each person's going to get an opportunity to answer those questions. And we're going to start at this end of the table. So you get to be the first end to, to answer the first question, which is, oh, I didn't put my glasses on. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, it's not that bad, but it's close. What is your long-term vision of Machosa? My long-term uh, vision of the Chosen is the recognition of the people, this community, its volunteerism, uh, its, it, its, its passion for who we are, respect for the environment, and for the, spe the respect of the land use controls that we have presently in place. The other thing that, is, that has been mentioned before, that to, in order to do that, we need to continue with our financial success and to keep the rural base that we have and not be tempted by doing other things that only lead down a slippery slope to further tax increases. Sure. Thank you. My long-term vision of the Chosen is, is not dissimilar from what we see now. We have a vibrant core. Uh, we have our schools that are operating with our children in it. Uh, we have low taxes. We have our reserves. We are able to support our volunteers, who in turn support our residents. We're able to facilitate uh, the community events that happen here. We're able to promote our way of life to others within the CRD. Uh, there are many in the, in the capital region that envy what we have here for a whole host of reasons. And uh, it would be nice if, if, some, if others that don't end up having a greater appreciation and understanding for what it is that we're doing here. So my long-term vision of Machosen is so that what you see today is what you will see in 10, 20, and 30 years. If opportunities arise that make sense for our community, that we look at them, that we explore them, that we bring them to the public with your feedback and input, that you have councils that are responsive to the needs of the community and listen to the wishes of what you want to see for your community as well. My long-term vision for Machosen, I hope, is very similar to yours. Pretty hard to talk that. Um, my long-term vision is also very much that the Chosen will remain what it is right now. A community of compassionate people that help each other. A community that looks after and stewards its uh, landscape. A community, uh, a council that will still keep, be financially prudent into the future. That sets a different direction from other communities. You know, I hope I'm going to be still here in the future to look after it and to uh, to be a part of it. I'm sorry, I don't know what else to say, but I, I think that if we continue looking after 
each other and we look and follow our o c p which is still an excellent document after thirty years that you're going to find that you live in the best community in b c pretty much the same we just want the chosen to stay rural and not be developed and to this end i i'm working very hard but also to provide much more um, or many more services for our seniors so that they can age in their own homes and don't have to go down to warehouse like places somewhere down in victoria that they can remain here in their own homes and also at working for sustainable agriculture so that much more of our arable land is under production and as always i'm after uh, support the active the arts and the active programs that, that, that are going on but i would one thing i would like to say that um, councillor mill and i together have been very active in promoting a chosen foundation and this is something that we between us and some other active like-minded citizens are promoting as a way for us to help preserve the chosen as it is so this is a plug to Perhaps you would like to know more about it. Please contact me. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see a chosen changing any more than it has for the last 160 years. There's a few more houses, but the, the mindset of the people out here that love this rural atmosphere hasn't changed. I don't see that changing. We have the best land use bylaw and best OCP that I've seen in, and I've been through a lot of municipalities. Uh, the one thing that uh, bothers me though is I want to see a gentler and kinder municipality for seniors so that in 20 or 30 years when I need to uh, go into a home or, or live in my own home when I'm aged I want it to be there, and that's one of the things that uh, Councillor Mitchell and myself have discussed at great length, and that's the one area where I would like to see Council come together and look at options for a chosen for seniors. And we have to remember, we still need the schools to keep Hans Helgeson open. How many schools have we seen closed in the last few years? So. I don't see much changes. Uh, just keep doing what you're doing now and uh, uh, try to be a little bit more friendly and uh, kinder to your neighbors. It's easy. Thank you. So as I said before, I've lived in the Chosen for 32 years. The district has been incorporated as a municipality for 27 years almost to the day when Herman Boak was sworn in as our first mayor. I see Machosen as being an ideal multi-generational community in which we can all afford to live and I agree with Larry, a kinder, gentler municipality where people base their information on facts, not fiction, not on gossip and rumors and I'm sure we're all intelligent enough to know what is true and what is false. Machosen is a wonderful place to live and I'm hoping that I'll be here for the next 30 years or so and that my children will be here for the next 60 years or so and if they ever get married, their children will still be here because our home is going to stay in the family. So 100 years from now, when you look up on the mountain, you'll still see that house sitting there and wonder who in the heck used to live there. Well, it's us and it's going to be our grandchildren and Machosen is just a wonderful place to live and it's all of us working together that keeps it that way. Thank you. I'm probably the rookie at this table for longevity in Machosen. Uh, I've only been here for 20 years, but I chose to move here because I'd heard about this community. And it kind of reminds me of what I grew up in, only mine was a bit smaller. I see a community where all people are treated fair and equitably. All services are provided so that everybody can enjoy the surroundings of the Chosen and all it has to offer. But as a community, not as a divided one as it is now. Thank you. And my vision of the Chosen, I've been here for 51 years. My vision of the Chosen 
It's pretty simple. Uh, I would like to see people try and get along for a change. I'm getting tired of the fights and the arguments and the whole and I'd like to hang around for the next 30 years so I can see this community come together. Because we still got a big split, and that split needs to be repaired, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Well, my vision is the same vision that I've had for pretty much all my life, and that is to keep this place the way it is. I talked about that at the beginning. <laughs> There's just something I'd like to say, and that is that I think that this community is pretty united. We just we're, we have undertaken the most divisive, probably, uh, initiative that we've seen in many years, which is the secondary suites, and I think everybody's handling it quite well, other than a couple of letters. I think this community is solid. It's one of the things that I really like about us. We're, we're a unified community. I, I, don't, I really don't get where the rest of this stuff is coming from. But... Our, our vision, and it's easy to talk about a vision, there's lots of people talk about their vision, but it has to be economically sustainable. And I think in the last three years we've done that. We have re rewritten the book on how to operate a municipality. We are now being recognized by the province as being a model of uh, how to run a small government. When people come to the province, the province says, go look at Machosa. I just finished doing a speaking tour up in Shawnigan Lake giving the message of how you can actually do this, how we can sustain over the long term a rural community without having to have commercial development or residential development in, in an urban sense. That goes back to, again, what I said at my opening. My vision is not only what it used to be, which is us staying the same as a, as a solid rural community, but my vision now is being able to present us as, a, as an example and many others around who are facing the same things and, and saying to them, no, you don't have to go the development route. You can do it on us. That's what my vision is. Well, I'll probably say this a couple more times tonight, but boy, it's a tough decision. I'm glad I'm not in your shoes. So the next question that I'd like each of you to answer, and we'll start with John, as he has the mic down at that end, we'll move down this end towards the bottom. What are the key issues we'll focus on if re-elected or elected? In your case, well, one of the first things we're going to have to do, of course, is uh, deal with the fallout of the secondary suites referendum. Um, I think all of the councillors, the existing councillors, have committed that we will uh, abide by whatever the results are. We've established parameters in the referendum that... Um, uh, we will follow. If it's if it's a yes, if it's a no, then we'll, we'll set about having to deal with the ones that we've got and uh, uh, things like that. Another issue that I really want to get addressed this term is upgrading our bylaws. A lot of our bylaws are out of date. Um, it's becoming more difficult to enforce them, so I think that's going to be one of my objectives as well. But the big objective is is to continue the direction that we've taken fiscally here. Again, like I said, we're operating completely differently than anybody else. We're doing it because we are rural. I want to develop that theme. I want, at the end of the next two years, to be able to say, hey, this isn't theory anymore. We have proven this is how you do it. There's the proof. So that's, that's my ultimate issue uh, for this next team. I guess my issue is pretty simple. Uh, number one is roads and the roads contract. I would tender that out tomorrow if I was in this chair because that roads contract will kill us. And being around machinery most of my life, I know what kills you in machinery and it's maintenance and it does kill you and it will kill us. That would be the first thing that would be gone if I was your mayor. Uh, detached, I support whatever the general public wants. If they go with it, fine, I can go with it. They don't want it, that's fine, I can go that way too. But those are the two things that, that I want to see straightened out quickly. I agree with Mr. Cooper on services. Uh, in a small rural community like this, things need to be set in stone. You need to know, with the terrain and the amount of roads that we have, that in a worst case scenario snowstorm, 
and you need an ambulance, you're going to get one. Not with a bunch of old equipment that we've bought. That this is a big question mark. I agree with Ed. I would like to see that in stone so that everybody can sleep well and not have to worry about anything in the worst case scenario. Detach suites, I've already stated I'm for them, but I will go with what democracy says. The majority of people want them, I will work to make it so. If they don't want them, I will also work to not make it so. Bylaw enforcement. Uh, there are bylaws that shouldn't be on our books. There are bylaws that need to be revamped. And there are new bylaws that have to be made. That is something that has to be done. But there must be a political will to enforce them. You can't just write something down and expect people to adhere to it because there's always those that will not. And that's why the bylaws there for that 1%. But if you don't have the will to make it work, then why did you write it down? It's useless. I don't profess to know all the ins and outs of the, all the issues in the chosen because I'm the rookie. But I'll tell you one thing, folks. My 30 years experience in another venue taught me to be a very, very quick learner. Thank you. Of course, the first thing that the council will have to uh, address after the election is the results of the referendum. I will certainly support whatever decision is made at that time. If indeed it is yes, then we'll proceed to draft the appropriate bylaws. If it is no, then we will have to take a serious look at the existing units that are in the Chosen and uh, figure out how to deal with it without uh, kicking people out of their homes because that is one thing that I will not do. The other thing that we will be faced with is the policing. And every election for the last oh, 10 years we've been talking about policing, policing, policing. And that is why when I was mayor there was the taxation put in place that accounted for a 33% tax increase that built up the police reserve to the million dollars that it is now so that we would have that buffer for, for policing. And I must add that uh, that taxation continued to be collected but was put into general revenue. So you're still paying that tax that I put in place, but it's not going to policing. And also the important thing to do with the newly elected council is to work together not have any divisiveness. I'm a professional. Whatever the outcome is, I will work with whoever you choose for me to work with. That's just the way I'm built, and I have great respect for the people of my chosen. Thank you. I think probably the number one concern of everybody's is the tab suites in the future, and the tab suites and how we deal with the in, from the past. We didn't, this council didn't create the problem that's out there now. It's been going on for a lot of years. The second is financing. I am, I'm assured by our chartered accountant that we will be facing no more than the, the uh, cost of living adjustment here for the CRD over the next five years. I don't pretend to be a financial whiz. I leave that up to him. The other two items are highway yard and land acquisition. We had a half a million dollars put aside to buy land, such as Lombard. Uh, that is no longer a requirement because we found the land right here in our municipal yard. And I have looked at this, I sat down with Jim Payton, we talked about it and the total cost and what it was going to cost us down the road. And uh, if any of you had problems last winter with snow, I don't believe you did. The, the roads were cleared 
unfortunately jim peyton is a little longer with us but his crew are and they're ready to go right now and i'm sure that we made the right move to have our own work yard we will not be subject to uh, some company from northern alberta or wherever uh, holding us to ransom thank you I think I will stay sitting, if you don't mind. Um, what will I do in the, in the, if I'm re-elected? Well, the things that, as I've said in my speech earlier, that really interest me is, well, the, the principal one is to continue with the Active Aging Committee for Seniors. That, I think, is one of my, that is my top priority, and I, I really want to see, within the next three years, a real, a real progress in services available locally for seniors. Um, agriculture is always a passion of mine and again I would work for sustainable agriculture, uh, much more education, farmers markets and uh, any uh, also the working to maintain the agricultural land reserves. Arts again is something that through the MACA which is part of the Chosen Council, or is funded by the Chosen Council, not funded by the Chosen Council, but supported by the Chosen Council. That again, I would like to continue and see it grow. A new gallery is proposed, and that again would be a great addition to our village. Um, getting on to the more serious side, bylaw enforcement is a real issue, and that is something we have to tackle in the new year. And as Mayor Ram said, we do need to upgrade our bylaws. And one final thing is to, I know, maybe to continue with the West Shore Parks and Recreation Association and to ensure that we, a, we keep the velodrome. Councillor Mill and I fought a hard battle to get it reopened after it was closed, and now the battle is to keep it, keep it open. Thank you. I think one of the most important things that we can do is stay the course in our finances. We are uh, very fortunate with our lowest uh, tax rate in the, in the uh, CRD. We have, uh, according to the CFIB, the, uh, there's only two municipalities in BC with a higher per capita cost than us. There's, only, there's nobody on the island with a higher per capita cost than us. We're doing really well, even by CFIB standards. They had some, uh, they had some, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, oh. it's nerve wracking up here, really. <laughs> but, we're, but we are doing really well. And there's a, like in the CFIB, they're saying we're spending, uh, we, uh, our increases in spending have been too high. Well, when you have, and they acknowledge this in the report, when you have a very low amount of, of money that you're spending, any increase seems large. Like if you were getting a dollar a day for something, and then you got a two dollars a day for it, that's a hundred percent increase. But if you're getting a hundred dollars a day for something, and you get another dollar, that's only a one percent increase. But it's the same dollar. So, you know, the CFIB has an agenda, and uh, their agenda is to explain things so that they will have the commercial tax rates lowered. If our t commercial tax rate is lowered, the money we get in grants and loot is lowered, and your residential taxes go up. So just keep that in mind. We are doing really well. Thank you. So regarding issues, well the first thing is, is I want to take some joy in the next three years if I'm fortunate enough to be returned to council. So one of the first things I'd look at doing is since I am one of five, uh, I'd like to sit down with my new, my new colleagues and decide what, what do we want to tackle in the next three years, what, what do we want to see in the next five to ten years and set out that plan in motion. Um, we're going to be working together for three years, so that's important. Uh, in regards to the secondary suites. The question that is going to be answered on Saturday is just the beginning of a very long journey, whether the answer is yes or no. And it affects every single one of us, and it's something that we need to have 
uh, some great dialogue with you as residents to determine how we're going to tackle the issues, whether we are looking at more enforcement, whether we are looking at uh, setting up for a public hearing, and the fallout and the outcome of that. Uh, so that's, those are, those are, first of all, I think the two things that this council is going to have to sit down and, and deal with. Following that, uh, on some other issues that are coming up, uh, treaty negotiations, I'm not sure because I haven't been part of it for three years, uh, where we're at in regards to what's happening with the treaty negotiations and uh, continuing the relationship building with our First Nations neighbours so that when they are given government status that we have a working relationship with them so that we can have our communities be synergized in what we're doing. Another exciting thing that is coming down um, the pipe in the next few years are the two new schools to replace Belmont. One of them will be in Colwood, just on our border, in the gravel pit, and it will also include an arts and cultural centre, which I think Machosen has some great potential to influence what happens there and what it looks like and how it can assist the artists that we have here currently in Machosen and hopefully our new and emerging artists coming up from our schools. Thank you. I think some of the important issues that we'll be facing in the next term are, first of all, if we go over 5,000 population in 2012, we are going to have to be negotiating a policing contract that needs to be fair and equitable. Secondly, we are in active negotiations with treaty uh, settlement. This involves, it's called Tamat. The, the entity that we're obviously uh, concerned about mostly is Beecher Bay. We certainly and have told them, we signed a memorandum of understanding with them uh, not too long ago, we certainly want to support them. Uh, we recognize their rights. We want to see them do well, but we also have to respect the fact that they need to respect the fact that we in the Chosen are concerned about our compatible land uses. Again, continued fiscal responsibilities. As Councilor Milne, our Chair of Finance, has said, we are in good shape. We have $4.8 million in reserves. The Government of Canada is in the whole $550 billion. I think we've done a pretty good job here. And again, the outcome of the secondary uh, suites issue will have to be dealt with. Thank you. I'd like to suggest we take a three minute break and then come back. So three to five minutes and then we'll, then we'll get into the second part of the questions. Um, otherwise, I think, I'm sure if you're sitting in these wonderful chairs, you might find, might want to stretch up a little bit. So, back in five, we'll, we'll get to the next part. Thank you. Well, I don't know any jokes, so usually when the crowd is, takes a long time to sit down, there's somebody up here telling jokes. You're not going to get that from me tonight. I tried that and my wife says, don't you dare tell jokes in public. Certainly want she's not around and there's too many people in this room that know her, so I better not even try that. So, thank you again for your patience. Uh, I think we've, we're, we should be out of here in about an hour. And uh, that's what we're aiming for. So we've had to rejuggle stuff. What's that? X Factor. I'm missing the Canucks. <laughs> you know, you know what my wife would say? Yeah. <laughs> no. I, I don't have any technology in the house. I got. I, I still have the big old TV, you know, with the two. Oh, yeah, wait. Okay. So thank you for your patience. And some of these issues, I'm sure you've, you've uh, heard them before, but you're going to hear them again tonight. And so we've had to rejuggle things, unfortunately, because Danny's not here. So what we're going to try and do, what we are going to do, not try, is we're going to start off with a question, two questions that are going to go to everybody. And it's going to be about everybody's favorite topic. DSS. So I, I had great trouble when I saw it on the, on the internet, when I saw the question come in, I went, DSS, DSS, District Secondary School. Nope, nope, that's not it. Sweets, something diabolical sweets. Anyway, I finally figured it out. So I'm gonna let John start off with this one. And the first question on the sweets is, if the public votes no on the referendum, will you refuse to support any attempt to amend the OCP 
or land use bylaw to accommodate detached secondary suites during the next council term if you are elected. Of course. <laughs> That's why we put it to referendum. Um, you know, it's... I'm sure a lot of you are going through a lot of wondering, geez, you know, should we, should we not, stuff like that. Well, that's what council would have had to have done too. And uh, we decided, no, this is a decision that's so important that it needs to go to referendum and the residents decide. It's a non-binding referendum because we're legally obligated to do that. But every one of us on council have said, I mean, it's binding, whatever the result is. And if the result is no, that's the end of it. Then we turn our attention then to do, dealing with the ones that we have. I think everybody pretty well knows I stand on detached suites. I support them all the way, but I can support also what the general public wants, and I'm part of the general public. If the general public says no to detached, that's fine with me, then I'll go with no. And if they go with yes, then I will go with yes, because either one is fine with me. I never thought I heard my, or hear myself say that I agree with the first person who spoke here, but uh, <laughs> uh, that's how it is. If uh, I'm sitting at the table and democracy has spoken, what you speak of will be carried out. It's not difficult. That, that's how it is. Personally, I'm for it because I think that it will strengthen this municipality. It will give people a chance in these very tough times to set up something for their children, for their families. And that's what community is all about, as far as I'm concerned. I know there's a lot who don't agree with that, but that's where I stand on this. But if it's a no, and I, if I'm at the table, democracy will speak and I will act for it. That's very simple. Thank you. I think that some of the angst in the community is because it is a non-binding referendum, but that is the legal mechanism that a municipality has to use with this type of question. And of course, I will support whatever the outcome is and I'll work to make that outcome easy on everyone. Thank you. I've got a note here in front of me. It says, hold the mic farther away. Very foggy. <laughs> it amazes me. We can speak to the moon and clear as a bell, but we can't get a system that works in a, in a hall. That's because the chamber can't afford a better system. <laughs> if you want to contribute to it, that means you okay. That's not going to happen, Steve. <laughs> I'd be a hypocrite if I didn't say I have supported detached suites in the past. I was very clear, I support, I oppose on my 2005 and 2008 flyers. But this time I've been as clear as I can be that democracy must rule. We have finally got this question to a referendum and that's more than anyone else has ever done. I will abide by the results of that. If it's no, I'll be disappointed, but I will abide by the results of that referendum. Thank you. Did you hear that? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, I have not been in favor of detached secondary suites. Uh, I see it as a slippery slope to subdivision and much more development. However, if the vote is uh, yes, then I will work, as, as a member of council, if I am re-elected, I will work towards that end. Um, I commit to abiding by the outcome of the referendum, whatever it is. Uh, it would be extremely disrespectful to this community if we didn't, all of us, abide by what you say. Um, if, if there's a long process that has to happen, and going to public meetings and stuff, but that process will be put in place if you, you vote to go ahead with this. And if you say no, then we still have to look at the issue of the detached suites that are existing. 
and uh, what we'll do with that. Thank you. Being elected to council is a, is a great responsibility uh, because you've put your trust in us to govern your community in, with as much fortitude and the ability to, uh, to look at all the information. The beauty of having this put to a referendum is that the answer will be very clear. Uh, either the answer is yes or no, and from that, uh, I would say that, that council has a responsibility, an obligation, to follow through with those wishes that you have given us, that direction that you have provided to us. And so if the answer is no, then the answer is no, and we go forward and look at and have the discussion with you, the community, how do you now want to deal with what currently exists, how are we going to focus our enforcement, what's the cost of that, and how do we look at this as, on a holistic level of this is our community, there are people who live in them, and what happens next? <coughs> This present council was informed by the public that you asked us to bring forth a question that could be held in referendum in conjunction with this election. We have done that. What my personal view on it is, is one of neutrality. There are several reasons for that. Number one, I'm chair of planning and zoning, and I'm also chair of public hearings. And I think it's very important that I not taint this process at all. Whatever my personal view is, is that. We, I, want to hear from you. I will abide by the results, whether they be yes or whether they be no. Okay, so Bob, I'm going to ask you to hang on to that mic because there's a second part to this question. And I've gone over it a couple times tonight, and I have to admit, I'm going to actually read it. So then breaking my own rule, there is a preamble to this. And I know you'll say, well, where's the question? I'll repeat the question part twice, okay? And as many times for his candidates as you want. So it says, in previous meetings, candidates, I haven't been in previous meetings, so I, I find that interesting. Previous meetings, you guys have another meeting? Go on. I'll tell you. Come on. I heard you know. In previous meetings, candidates have said they will honor the outcome of the referendum and the conditions that it specifies. However, the conditions do not say whether a DSS, a district secondary school, would be a, no, sorry, would be a standalone building at 70 square meters or would they be allowed in an accessory building? Okay, second now with paragraph two. Inasmuch as, as accessory buildings are allowed to be 200 square meters, an enforcement of zoning restrictions, such as floor area allocations within buildings, is this large and continuing problem. DSSs in accessory buildings are likely to grow to be essentially full-size secondary houses. Here's the question, okay? Now there's a context. Therefore, do you agree that DSSs, if approved, should only be allowed as standalone buildings? Do you agree that DSSs, if approved, should only be allowed as standalone buildings? Bob? Okay. First of all, there's, an, there's, there's some uh, incorrect information in the statement that you made in your preamble. You stated that a uh, accessory building could only be about 200 square meters. I'm not sure about the meters, but let's give it to you in feet. The existing secondary suite bylaw allows for a suite within an existing dwelling of up to 40% of the gross floor space up to a maximum of 962 square feet, more or less. What the detached suite issue would allow would be under those three parameters that council has put forward to you to allow that to occur outside of the existing dwelling. Not both, one or the other. It's a transfer of the people and all of that from what is currently allowed inside the residential building to another structure or to a stand alone. For example, if you had an existing garage or barn or whatever, and you wanted to put something above it on the side of it or whatever, and if you could conform with those, and if the answer is yes, then that would be allowed. Or if you wanted to do something independent and, and separate, you could do one, again, depending on the, the, the percentages and the rest, but it's going to be smaller and it's going to have to be closer to your residential uh, 
dwelling, and it's going to have to be further than your neighborhood's property lines. Okay? The other thing with accessory structures is, if you want to put a detached suite in it, you're going to have to meet those setbacks. And that's not clear at all in that preamble. So there's an awful lot to this. I hope I've explained it a little bit better. But it certainly, if the answer is yes, based on what council has said here tonight, I hope I've explained it a little bit better. That is the opinion of the author, not of what is before them in the referendum. A detached secondary suite, by its nature, is detached from the main dwelling, whether or not it's in a garage or a barn, or if it's a separate structure that you, that you build based to the parameters, if the answer is yes. Um, so can I agree that um, a detached secondary suite would only be in a standalone building? No, because we are basing it on the three parameters that are that have been set out in the referendum question, and that is the basis point, if the answer is yes, where the discussion starts and where you start the process to change the land use bylaw. So it, it's, it's an interesting question, but as Bob has pointed out, it wasn't, I, I'm not sure that the preamble before allows the question really to be answered properly, um, other than to say that um, the parameters that are set out and that would then be approved through public hearing and, and the due process uh, reality of this, um, what's left is if the standalone building matches the requirements, then that's what's allowed. If it doesn't match the requirements, it's not allowed. Uh, I, I understand, I think, the concept of this question is that are people still going to be able to cheat? Is that what it is? Yeah. <laughs> people can always cheat. They will always find a way, someone will find a way to cheat. But most of us are not going to do that. And the question was drafted in, or, in the way it is in order to allow uh, a detached secondary suite which will have the least effect on the neighbors and a lesser effect on us. Uh, creating another footprint on your property, which adds to your environmental impact. You, as far as I can understand it, you will be allowed to have a suite above a garage if it meets code and all the other requirements here. Where you're gonna have a lot of problem is putting a suite into a building you already have that exists, because it will probably not meet the parameters or the code. I hope that clarifies things a bit. Could I ask you to read the question again? Just a question, Steve. Jeez, it just disappeared. <laughs> okay. Yes. And, and, and we don't take any credit for the accuracy. I mean, accuracy is okay. She doesn't want the preamble. Any question? The question is, therefore, do you agree that the, the, the ESSs, if approved, should only be allowed to stand alone buildings? Yes. <laughs> I believe that was the intent when we put this together, that this, from this day forward, they would be treated separately than existing suites. So if we're dealing just now with the new bylaw, uh, you can only build 753 square foot building. It has to be 50 feet from the house property line, so there is no possible way that could ever be subdivided, because then you would be 25 feet if you tried to subdivide it. So that was the intent of this. The other issues of, we're, we're now allowed to build an accessory building, 2,153 square feet. Now, we can put a studio in it, we can do a lot of things, but it's, if you're gonna cheat, you're gonna cheat in something like that, in an accessory building. But a standalone building, you're not going to cheat because it's it's been approved. You start adding on to that, you'd have 46 phone calls in about this, this person is breaking the law. So this is a long way of saying no, but uh, to me, that 
says it all. It, it stops any future arguments about subdividing or anything else. So yes, standalone only after this date. I'm having flashbacks to a high school math exam here. <laughs> a detached suite is a standalone building as long as it meets the requirements of the bylaw that will be drafted and approved by council. That's the simplest answer I can give you. Thanks. I was not privy to the drawing up of the criteria. I didn't sit in on it. I never heard any discussions. I just read what has been put into the referendum. Uh, my understanding, just as a citizen, is that it is a standalone building. Uh, you can't take your garage and turn it into a detached suite because it won't meet the criteria of the distances from the property lines. Uh, and a new construction pretty well is the only way that you're going to get a detached suite. If, and I raise the point, if the proper bylaws are drawn up, and we were talking earlier about cheating, well, there are people who will do that. And bylaws, as I said before, are only there for one reason, to take care of that 1% or whatever it may be. But we need also the right bylaw and the will to enforce it. You can't threaten, you take action. That's the only thing that's going to keep everybody on the same track. Short guess. I have a very, very short answer. I, I thought we were always talking about standalone. I didn't follow the I thought it was always standalone. And if it is standalone, then I support it. My answer to your question is yes. I don't think I can make an answer as simple as that. Uh, we've established specific parameters, and, and those parameters will be, um, I mean, if I'm returned to council and we, have, uh, and we have committed as a council to establish a bylaw based on those parameters that everyone voted for. The, the fine details have to go to, uh, will require a revision to the land use bylaw, and there will be public input to that. So, in a scenario where, let's say, it passes resoundingly, and we get a resounding expression of the public that says, we want to be able to put these in our garages that are pre-existing, then I think we're going to be obligated to do that. So, would I like to see them stand alone only? Yes, but I can't say that I'm going to say absolutely that's the way it's going to be because we have to, we have to do with what the public uh, will is on the finer issues of this uh, issue. I supported the amalgamation with East Souk, or at least looking at it. I supported, I shouldn't say I supported the amalgamation, I supported bringing it to the residents, and I had hoped that it would be in a, uh, a referendum right now. But because the treaty got accelerated, and we had no idea, and we still don't have any idea, what the outcome of the treaty is, and what impact that would have on the final configuration of both of our communities, I actually uh, recommended to the council that we withdraw 
uh, for the moment any discussion about ESU. So we put it on hold. If we'd taken it to a vote and it had been turned down, we would never be able to discuss it again. The province wouldn't allow us. But because we put it on hold, we still have the opportunity to rejoin that discussion at some point if it appears to be beneficial. As for amalgamating with the rest of the Western communities, it would be the end of Machosan. We would end up looking like Happy Valley in three years. It's one of the reasons that I am so determined to have our finances in such good shape that we can say when the amalgamation time comes, no, we should not be amalgamated with the rest of them. We have no debt, they've got tons of debt. We have low fixed costs, they've got high fixed costs. Apples and oranges. Where we should be amalgamated, if we're going to be forced to be, is into a rural amalgamation. So, I don't know if I've answered the question or not, but, but um, yeah, okay. Read the question again. Okay. How do you feel about possible amalgamation not only with East Suit but also with other West Shore communities? Well, I've been opposed to amalgamation ever since I lived in the majority district, and I'm still opposed to amalgamation. All amalgamation will do with us is put us in the bank of the East Suit, Leave Sands, and wherever. You got an eight eagle, then go and join Sands. It's not the choice. It's just the way it is. It's fun to me. I was not for amalgamation with East Sioux, and I'm not for amalgamation with any other municipality. We've got our own community here that we can work on, work at, make better, do better by everybody. Why would we want to take on their problems? So, again, I have to say, twice in the night, but no, no amalgamation of any, any part. Well, that was team number one. Very good. How long was that, Dan? Well within time. Okay. Thank you for being uh, very clear with your answers. It helps us get out of here by 9 o'clock. Okay. Team two. What impact will Machosen, now having its own public works yard, have on our roads and up east? It's a huge unknown. The way it's been set up is a two-year trial period. I'm not entirely convinced it was a good move. So if elected to council, that will be one thing that I'll do too, is really investigate the pros and cons and the costs of everything. Because there's been reference here tonight about how if we put it out to tender, then Tilma would require us to take a company from Alberta or Timbuktu or God knows where. That is not entirely correct. You don't have to take the lowest bid or anything like that, all you have to do is prove the reason why you rejected their bid. You just have to show a good reason for not having their bid. So you're allowed to take whatever bid that you want that suits your own municipality. But the answer to the question is, it's a huge unknown, and I have to investigate it further. It's true. Uh, that you do have to take the low bid on Tilma. You put out a, a uh, request for consideration. It goes to bid BC, and you have to take the low bid. You don't get the choice anymore. What we can do now that we have the works yard, we can keep these contracts, small contracts such as ditching, brushing, and other things like that. We can keep that under $50,000, and we can go, and I would hope we will be going, as we did last summer uh, for the brushing contract and the ditching contract. Uh, there are contractors in Machosan now who are able to bid on that, and they got the job. Uh, I don't see this as being any unknown. I think it's very... Uh, we paid about a, a half a million a year for the last contract. and. Uh, we actually paid 321000 and some odd dollars, but we know that cost. We knew what it cost us until June 30th of, two th uh, of 2011, and we have to go one year at least until we can do a comparison between Jim's contract 
and what our works yard. And we have those two years to look at it, and that's what I would do. Look at it after one year, do a comparison, and we'll know down to the penny whether it's a good deal. Thank you. Um, I think Larry has expressed it very well from that particular point. I would just like to add something that, a bonus that has occurred that we hadn't even envisaged when we decided to put up the works yard, and that is that all three workers, main our workers in the works yard, are members of the fire department. And this for the first time means that we have on site, at 20, uh, during the day, proper trained firefighters to respond to any uh, accident or, or fire that happens. In the past, it's always been hit or miss whether there's been anyone in the chosen who could actually you know, perform for our voluntary fire department because most of them work outside. And this has been a huge plus. And this is something that I would like to add to what Larry said as, as a bonus that we hadn't envisaged, but it is a great bonus. Very good. So team two, you are about uh, 22 seconds along with the team one. <laughs> so we get two here. You get, yes. <laughs> so team three, before I get into a question, I just want to remind you that Kelly's going around now with the white cards and a pen. So if you'd like to write a question and you don't want to come to the mic to ask, please do so now. Thank you. Okay. So last question before we get into written out questions. Okay, where'd that one go? Oh yeah, was busy. Okay. How can the chosen balance the sometimes competing needs of farmers and rural property owners? Can I take the amalgamation question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would have said the same thing. <laughs> You know, honestly, I don't know how to answer that. Um, in the chosen rural community, we're very supportive of our, of our agricultural base. I'm not sure exactly where there's the competing interests come in here. I haven't ever heard anybody complain about having a farm near them. Um, I'm sorry, I have no other answer to that, but I can answer the amalgam amalgamation question. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's not your question. <laughs> sorry, can you repeat? Sure. Find it. How can Machosen balance the sometimes competing needs of farmers and rural property owners? Now, as the person who sent this question, if you're in here, if you want to clarify, that would. I'm, I'm not sure what competing needs would be. Um, in living here for, for 23 years, um, farming is very much a part of this community, and I would hope actually it would it would be a little bit more, just in regards to getting some of our young people in our in our two schools that we have here, uh, a little bit more interested in it. So, I mean, if, if I suppose, I, I guess, if there's a squabble, you know, if when someone spreads chicken manure or if uh, the, the rooster decides to crow at five o'clock in the morning when sunrise really only happens at seven, I suppose those are issues, but those are issues that need to be sorted out between neighbors. Uh, and farming is very much a, an active part of this community and it should be, it's part of our identity. In my nine years of being on council, I've never seen anyone get up at the podium and complain about a competing uh, problem with a farm next door. And I guess the other thing I'd like to mention is, is that those who might be new to this community, who may come from elsewhere, you know, when you get down the road and you see the lambs and, and, and the apple trees and the rest, well, with that goes right to farm uh, legislation. And that's what you're buying into here. And if you don't like that, then go live on a 2,000 square foot lot in Langford. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> You're going to go first on this. Great answer. I, 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 the reason I said yes is because many years ago, I, when I lived up in Smithers, and I lived in a rural area, and used to get all these complaints. Exactly what Kara just talked about, right? The chicken manure, or the cows are out in the field too early, and it's like, if you don't like it, don't live there. I'm sorry, I'm not biased. Would you like to pick a question? <laughs> <laughs> and this is for all three of you, by the way. You have to read it. Oh, would you mind? Steve, you, yes, I can read that. Oh, <laughs> yeah. 
Okay. If current government lands become part of treaty negotiation package, <coughs> how will the chosen make up for the lost tax revenue? Well, currently, uh, boy, this is tough, and I'm not trying to dodge a question here, but there is confidentiality in the treaty negotiation process and lands. But I, I think it's fair to say and safe to say that at this present time, the federal government has said that they have no land that they are ready yet to declare as surplus. Until federal lands like DND, Rocky Point, or any of those others are declared surplus, they cannot be asked as lands of interest by uh, an Indian band. So uh, that's about all I can say on that. Um, to follow up with, with Bob, because his answer is correct, uh, the other lands I guess the, pe the people are concerned about are the lands that are held by the province, uh, which we do not receive any monies from at this time. So um, at this point, the, the question can't really be answered because the, the unknown is the fact that we that at this time there is there is no lost revenue uh, if the land is given. Um, as they say, the, the, the provincial crown lands, we don't get any revenue from them. If there was some loss of uh, federal lands and uh, some subsequent loss of uh, grants in lieu, um, well, that's what this municipality and this council has been looking at and um, making sure that we are the most fiscally prudent and nimble community that there is so that we could uh, react easily and quickly to any loss of revenue without having it affect your taxes. That's why we have uh, put in this works yard so that we can control the amount of work they do and the costs that are associated with it. That's why we have uh, been uh, upgrading and looking after our infrastructure deficit so that we don't have huge infrastructure costs that we will have to deal with if we have a loss of revenue. We don't want to see this community change because we need more tax dollars. So that's why we've been very nimble and very fiscally prudent. Why the different sizes in suites in the house to DSS? Uh, we looked at this intensely for several sessions with our planner, and we came up with the 600 square feet and the distance from the house as the most all-round logical way to go. Uh, Different committees may have come up with different solutions, but that's what this committee came up with. A number of years back, uh, up until probably five years ago, we could build only 646 square foot suite in a house. That was deemed too small for families. It was raised to 969, which it is today, but it's only 40% of the main building. Why did we come to the 753 square feet that we allow now for a detached suite? With five people in, in uh, discussing this, uh, you're going to have five different opinions. There was a lot of give and take on this. Uh, the 753 was something that, that we all agreed to, that we could agree to, to get it to referendum, or else uh, we just wouldn't have gone anywhere on it. Well, I'm at an unfair advantage because I wasn't part of the decision-making process for the wording of the question on the referendum. But in my own personal opinion, a suite is a suite, whether it's within a house or in a standalone building. And I believe myself that they should both be the same size. But I was not part of that decision-making process, so 
We have to go with the decision makers. Pretty sure it was Morley that wanted to answer that, but uh, <laughs> that's okay. Um, amalgamation for a chosen is is not an option. I mean, you take a look out here, and, and we don't we don't fit with uh, the rest of the West Shore, if that's what you're meaning. Um, you know, it's one thing to look at other communities and whether or not it makes sense. Um, I'm sure you all are aware. Colwood and Langford has spent some time discussing the matter, and they have done some things jointly together. But as far as Machosen goes, um, as has been stated, uh, I believe actually by John, was that amalgamation of Machosen within a greater area, we would lose what we have here. There are other more suitable places within the capital region for development. Machosen is not one of them. And so for me, amalgamation for Machosen is not something that makes sense. Now, is amalgamation in the greater CRD, does it make some sense? Quite possibly, and that's a discussion that should be had. I know that if you take a look at what happened with the Blue Bridge, one of the reasons why it was so difficult to get funding dollars initially was because uh, the city of Victoria is 83,000 people, whereas Greater Victoria is 380,000 people. And unfortunately, upper levels of government don't view it that way. They view it as what they see in that one individual municipality. So coming back to uh, amalgamation, it's not for Machosen. It may be for the region, but I don't think that we would be part of it. I just, I have never heard a Machosen resident say they want to amalgamate uh, with, with the greater region. Thank you. And the question is, if the referendum result is yes, and after the ensuing public hearings, the conditions regulating DSS change substantially, will you still feel bound to uphold the results of the referendum? Hmm. Uh, I agree with it as it is now. This question is asking, uh, after the ensuing public hearings, the conditions regulating DSS change substantially. I have to see what they are first. Uh, your question is asking me to draw a conclusion or an opinion on pie in the sky. Because what will they be? I don't know. I'd have to see. If it's for the greater good and democracy again, we will do that. But I, this answer here, I have no answer to this because it is hypothetical. When and if it changes, yes, I'll look at it. But I can only state now that I will uphold the results of the referendum as written, not what may happen down the road. I don't know what will happen then, so I'm not going to make a conclusion. Thank you. Any, uh, as, I, as I've explained before, this has to go, it'll, it'll require a change to land use uh, bylaw, and we'll have to go to a public hearing. And a public hearing is a survey of public opinion. You don't sit there and add up the numbers and say, okay, there's more numbers here, there's more numbers there. You listen to the public hearing, you look at the weight of the evidence, and, and the amount of evidence provided. We have established four parameters 
on the, on the uh, ballot. There is no public hearing will reach those survey numbers. So if we have a public hearing which says something contrary to the parameters, it's not going to matter because the ultimate public hearing was the referendum. So, yes, you can be assured that, at least as far as I'm concerned, and I know the rest of the council was, is that those parameters will be adhered to. It's what the majority of the residents will have established one way or the other on those parameters. That's the largest survey that we can have. So, I don't care what what a smaller public hearing would say, contrary to the parameters. The parameters would have to stay. Okay, just to change it up, we'll start with, the, with team two this time. Karen, you get it. Be careful, there's some dangerous ones. Pass the mic now. Okay, who lives on Rocky Point Road? <laughs> Should TELUS be allowed to put the cell tower on Rocky Point Road? Mm. Yeah. Well, on the question. <laughs> I don't think TELUS or anyone should put a cell tower where it's not accepted by the immediate residents. Um, I'm quite curious as to why TELUS chose that site in the first place. There's been all kinds of information, whether it's true or not, that's been circulated about it and it's caused a huge kerfuffle in the community. So, you know, if the people of Machosen have cell phones and they don't get good cell service, we don't have to obligate the people on Rocky Point Road to accept the tower. They need to look at all the options. And if there is no option in Machosen, then if you move to Machosen and have a cell phone, you just have to accept the fact that some areas you're not going to have service. I think this is a rather loaded question here. It says Rocky Point Road, but are we talking about Rocky Point up uh, 600 feet or whatever on the Knights of Columbus property which we probably are there might be somewhere on Rocky Point that meets the criteria set down by the federal government I don't think there is uh, but uh, should they be allowed on uh, the uh, property up the road uh, no they should not um. Should, the two, should tell us be allowed to put the cell tower on Rocky Point Road? Absolutely not. The, point, the site that they chose was in one of the most densely populated areas of the Chosen. The Chosen is a very large district, and there surely must be somewhere else where they could find to put their tower. Thank you. Great answer. This issue of cell towers is not just the Chosen's or Colwood's or View Royals. It's across the country. It's an issue that I would encourage every one of you to take some time to learn about because there's some, I believe personally that there's some real health issues there that are only beginning to show. And why does Canada have its legislation being one of the weakest in the industrialized nations? Just have to ask yourself that question. That was the point. Maybe should be there. So, process question. I thought you said there weren't going to be very many to touch. Secondary suite questions? Uh, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll save this one for the end of the night. So, yeah. <laughs> the problem is only a couple of them. Okay. Why <laughs> do detached secondary suites meet the needs of family and community beyond non detached suites? Say it again. The question is, why do detached suites meet the needs of family and community beyond non-detached suites? Does anybody want to explain that question? I can't explain it. Um, 
sure. question. I guess my concern is why does secondary speech need to be detached? I've never heard to this day why the speech needs to be detached and why the, the, the interests of the family can't be served within the existing parameters. If speech are in the house, the needs of the family and community are met. Are you answering my question for me? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Could, excuse me, could someone who has had their mother-in-law live with them for 48 years? <laughs> Most of you know that I'm not in favor of detached suites, and uh, I think that the um, you could, uh, for one thing, it's more affordable just to uh, reconfigure your own home than to build a whole separate dwelling in order to accommodate your uh, your suite needs. And uh, I, I, I'm personally, I've heard arguments about why people think that they need them. Uh, I just don't agree with them. For me, uh, a suite should be within your home because it reduces your footprint on the environment and on the landscape around you. And I think all of the it reduces the the, the problems with neighbors because they're in your home and you're looking after the. the if they're going to bother anyone, they're going to bother you. Um, you know, I can understand. Maybe you don't want your kids that close to you, but uh, you know, personally, I think there is no really good reason for detached suites. So I'm going to be careful about talking about the mother situation because mine's in the back of the room. <laughs> um, detached suites don't need to be in existence to, to help a, a family. There's, as, as you've stated, uh, those needs can be met with an attached suite. I think the reason why it's being discussed in fact, I know the reason why it's being discussed because it was discussed for the nine years that I was on council and it had been discussed previously to, to my tenure on council, um, is that they currently do exist in Machos and they've existed before in corporation, they exist now. Um, some people have issues with them, some don't. Uh, the issue of bylaw enforcement has, always comes up. Of course, it's complaint driven. Um, and, you know, do we need to relook at our bylaws to make sure that they are enforceable, that they are meeting the needs of our community? Absolutely. So to answer the question, no, it does not have to be a detached suite to meet, the need, to meet the needs of a family or the community. The issue is that they do exist. Is this something that we want to uh, legalize in the chosen? And if we don't, then what do we do with the ones that currently do exist and the families and the individuals that live in them now? This just proves why council asked the public do you want us to come up with a question and why we have published one and put it to referendum? Your point is well taken, but it's only one of many in the debate of yes, I would like these, or no, I would not like these. And again, this is why we have gone to the public and it is for you to give guidance to the next council as to how this issue would proceed. We could, I'm sure tonight, and, and this has gone on for a long, long time here in the Chosen, you know, kind of divide the room up into pro-secondary suites detached or non-secondary suites detached. Uh, we can we can talk about values, we can talk about vision, we can say why can't it be served on the inside. We have heard this over and over again, and that's why we are doing what we're doing. Thank you. I can see how you can just keep asking more and more questions about this stuff, though. No more suites. No more sweets, okay. The last question, which uh, is for each and every one of you, and I'm going to read it out first, and then I'm going to pass it on so it's rather long, so that each of you have an opportunity to at least read it and then answer the question that's there. 
A major component of sustainability is a community's ability to have a strong and vibrant local economy with a set of essential services and room for small local business. This doesn't comfort me, by the way. <laughs> to provide residents with desired goods. What is your vision for the village center into the future? Well, we've, we've just gone through this with uh, extensive public hearings, round tables, and everything else to uh, make the land use, or pardon me, the OCP revisions regarding the village center. Um, I don't think my vision is as important as, as the information we gathered from the public vision, and that was the end result of it. The vision, I mean, my own personal vision is pretty much what you see. Um, we have got the capability of having a lot more in the town center than exists. But it's not financially viable for people to do it. The reason we don't have a lot of things here is, is just because we're too close to the other major centers that, that have all of those services and nobody can afford to put the money up that's required to start a business out here. So hence we've moved into uh, things like tractor time, which I think was, was good, but it turned out that they didn't have the economic base here to continue and they had to move up island. Um, now we have, and I'm quite delighted to see Kim Hill operating her, her outfit out there, and I hope this community really supports it. it that's the kind of a thing that really uh, helps build an identity in our community. But again, um, this is something that the public decides on, has decided on. So told you what my vision is, but we've actually acted on what the collective vision was through all the public hearings and everything. a little bit in the town center but we're dealing with private property in the town center and uh, if the people that own the property don't want to do anything with it then there's nothing going to happen. I do know that uh, Sandy Gilbert tried several years back to do a little operation at her place and she was denied. I, I have heard that uh, Mr. Bickerdyke tried to put in some sort of a repair department or something in his shop. He was denied. So if we deny everybody from doing anything in the town core, the town core is going to stay the same way as it is because it's all private property. So I think we're just wasting our time discussing it. While the question was being answered by the two gentlemen to my left, I was writing. Uh, I hate to say this, but from what I understand, Mr. Cooper has hit the nail on the head. The majority of the great property at the village core is privately owned, and there is not a will there to do anything with it. And therefore, what can you do? Uh, I don't know about the businesses that attempted to do something and were denied. It's not part of the process at that time. So I can't uh, draw a conclusion on that. But I understand it's privately owned. Unless there's a will of a private citizen to forfeit those lands or allow something to happen on them, it's not going to happen. Most, the land in the village court is privately owned and a lot of it is agricultural land. The only thing that we as a municipality can do is when we review our OCP to put a plan in place that will allow someone who owns the land, if they have the will, to proceed with whatever is allowed within our official community plan. So I think we should have a vision. It shouldn't be my vision. It should be the community's vision, which is in place right now. And as I said, it will be reviewed when the OCP is reviewed again. But everything is driven by economics and a person's will to do something. So I don't believe at this particular point of time that there is the economic will to make any great changes in the village center. And it's quite lovely the way it is anyways. That isn't an easy question to answer, but as an example, I'll take the old garage, Lisa G's property. She could have rented that out 10 times over if she could rent three spaces there. There's been a lot of interest 
everything from <coughs> a bakery to a dentist to, I won't get into anything else, but it's the treatment plant that's required for that many bathrooms. It's really the problem in the village center and it's a problem all over because right now you're talking for a sim simple treatment plant, uh, you're talking thirty to fifty thousand dollars and the economics are just not there to allow somebody to do that. So I don't see, uh, I'd like to think there's going to be lots of business in the village center. I think we're going to probably see 20 years from now pretty much what you see now. But we do have one of the most popular restaurants in the area. We have a nice coffee shop and we also have a, a number of trails that are now being uh, formulated to allow people to come in, park in the village center, do a walk around, buy some uh, coke or a bar at the grocery store, go have lunch afterwards. So that will support, if we have a trail system around, it will support to a degree the businesses that are there, but I don't see any big change in the near future. Uh, we moved to Machosen in uh, 1993, and in the ensuing years, I've seen many businesses come and go in Machosen. Pizza parlors, uh, artsy shops, all sorts of things have come and gone, and they've all gone because the basic fact is that there's just not enough business here to support them. 5,000 people is not enough uh, to support any sort of business and they certainly wouldn't be able to rely on people coming from out of town to buy things here. So I think it's just the fact we're just not big enough. Um, so, we, uh, uh, to address the beginning of that uh, preamble, um, as a municipality, we allow everybody to have a home-based business. So that, feeds into the sustainability of the chosen, that you can do, uh, under certain parameters, a home-based business. And it helps support a lot of artists and a lot of artisans and uh, a lot of uh, car repair and everything. Um, so it doesn't all have to be in a village center. Uh, we have a thriving, well, pretty thriving farming community, and they use our village center for their farmer's market, which is very successful. Um, we, we do have some concerns coming up. MACA, the Arts and Cultural Center in the school, is going to be uh, losing its temporary use permit in another year or so, and we're gonna have to find a way to keep the Arts Center going there somehow. Um, I really would like to see a doctor's office somewhere because I think one of our biggest concerns is we're losing doctors and they don't have a place for a replacement to come and uh, and uh, look after us. So, um, you know, you, for the bigger retail sense, I don't think that the village center will change very much unless we want to support our local uh, businesses more. The beauty of living in the Chosen is we get to live in this wonderful area that we live in and 10, 15 minutes down the road, we've got the Red Barn Market, we've got entertainment, we've got shopping, um, and right here at home, we do have the farmer's market if you take a look around um, our village center here, I was just making some notes. Uh, you've got the Arts and Cultural Center, you've got youth activities with the preschool, with the bike park, you've got your emergency services, you've got community services with the church and with the MCA. Uh, we have our farmer's markets. Uh, we've, we've got businesses. We actually have some pretty, pretty cool stuff sitting right here in our own village center. Um, that we should be, you know, proud of and continuing to promote within our own residents as well as within the residents of our neighboring communities to have them come here and see our farmers market, go through the go through the uh, the community house if they need to host events, go and take a look at the arts and cultural center, uh, and provide support that way. Uh, one thing, I'd, as as has been pointed out, the majority of the land within the village core is private property. Um, I would suspect most of the people that live there like living there because of the same reasons why we like living here uh, and don't really want to see it developed because it's right on their doorsteps. Um, so 
if there's an idea, it's incumbent on council to take a look at that idea, and a good example of that is the cafe, um, which originally there was some pushback from actually having it there, and now it is a thriving center of our downtown core, and it has allowed other businesses to come up. We have the coffee shop, um, the feed and tax store. We have seen other businesses come and go. So with what we have, We've got a pretty good basis to build on and to continue to support those organizations and businesses that do operate in our village core. And, uh, sorry, cut me sir. And uh, I'm, I'm happy with what we've got, but I also, if, if there is an idea that comes forward, I'd, I'd like to hear about it and I'd like to put it forward to the rest <coughs> of the residents and say, is this something that fits? The first land use issue and OCP review issue this council this past term dealt with was the village center core. We held numerous consultations, round tables, open houses, surveys with the public. The end result of it was basically a arts and culture and of course the agricultural component of what you see presently in the village core. It does allow anyone in that designated area to come forward with their innovative idea and, and, and to, to get a fair hearing on it because it's a leg up. They have the right to do that, to get it zoned after a public hearing process and hearing from the public on an idea. I think what's being asked here is like, why don't we have a gas station or why don't you zone part of that land a gas station or a Canada Post or maybe some other things that you might have in mind. And the answer is, it's not a council-driven initiative. It's driven by economics and the people who live in that area. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, I go live. It's uh, just, uh, just after nine, and we have a wrap-up now. I'm going to ask every person to take maximum two minutes and request that you keep it down to a minute for a closing oh, statement. Oh, 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 okay. 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 Thank you for reminding me. I saw nine o'clock and I thought, let's get out of here. <laughs> You're right. I'm guilty of that. Okay. Would you like to go back to the mic then, ma'am? Uh, the question is, I have, I have a minute, I have a minute, to, it's going to be to the mayor, but I have a minute, according to your agenda, on the web page. Now you've already used 20 seconds. So if it's, if it's yes, then you guys are off the hook because you don't have to deal with those uh, secondary suites that are already there. I just heard that in the last 20 minutes and I didn't have a clue prior to this. So now I'm really agitated. So you're going to... In your newsletter, you said, what will happen next? The authority to seek community <coughs> opinion is blah, blah, not binding on the council. Therefore, regardless of the result, the newly elected council is not required. Well, you're not even going to go that route if there's a yes vote. And you, you said that public opinion it will be uh, too small or not big enough for you to be concerned about after Saturday's vote. We all know that about 32% of the municipalities come out and vote. So there's another 68% to consider. Those people need to count. And we know that democracy is expensive. I'm a story. But those after the fact, if it's yes, we need to consider. Three houses in a row, 66% of them are cheaters. 33% of us have to deal with this 33 on one side, 33 on the other, for people who are doing the cheating, and it's not fair. I'm the sorry. Question. The question is, Mayor, are you going to pro promise me that if I vote for you, that you will consider carefully everything after the fact, even if we vote yes? Yes, of course. I, I, I guess I didn't make myself clear. We've established four parameters. I understand the parameters. That's right. Okay, but if there are, let's say, a thousand people who vote yes, and that's probably going to be, I mean, whichever side. Listen. No, actually, we get about, 
we get about a 55% turnout here. So let's say there's a thousand people that vote yes. That's a thousand people that have said, those are the parameters that we want. So if, if we have a public hearing that has 150 people at it and say, no, we don't want those parameters, well, the thousand takes precedence over the 150. So that's why I'm saying that those parameters stay because that's the biggest sampling survey we will have. What happens once we have established a bylaw, if the answer is yes, is that that will take care of the new bills only. What will then our job will be to go back and deal with the ones that are already existing. And that's going to be another big problem. It's one that no council has ever faced here before. Uh -huh. So well, there's a question. Why not? One question. I'm sorry, but there's nobody lined up here. Why not? It's because because the council because the well, I mean I don't know why not. This council said we're going to address it and we did. And, and that that's all I can say. And, yeah. Finer points that aren't concluded in the in the uh, parameters will be determined through the public hearing process. The finer points, the main points that are established in the criteria, will stay unless we can be somehow convinced that there was a greater sampling size than the amount of people that voted for. It. So again, again, if, I mean, have we ever had a public hearing that had a thousand to twelve hundred people at it? No. No, the, the referendum okay. vote has the largest sampling. But it, you need the bylaw to support the yes. Yeah. Well, I and a bylaw will be written to support the yes if the answer is yes, based on those parameters. Maybe the question is not fair because you don't have the appropriate bylaws to support yes. Exactly. Why do we get them if the answer determined? That's right. When, when the answer. Yes. Okay, but that is the, that's job number two. If the answer is yes, then we will deal with the new bills. We will establish a bylaw. I mean, Bob is the best planning chair I've ever had. I trust him to be able to come up with a bylaw that will meet all of the, all of the, the conditions. I'm sorry, can I have another and question? Will you promise to enforce them? It, there, I'm glad you asked, asked that question, because you know what? We do enforce them. We enforce every complaint and we have shut down illegal suites based on legitimate complaints. Are we going to go out uh, with the secondary suite police and, uh, and bust everybody that we can lay hands on? No, we're not going to do that. Either way, it doesn't get us off the hook in dealing with the existing ones. Again, again, this council has done something no other council has done. They took the bit between their teeth and dealt with it, and I trust that that's going to happen again in the next term. Thank you for, uh, for your question. And thank you for your assistance. Well, that's what we're here about. Democracy yeah, is not easy. That's not cheap either. Yeah, that's true. Any other questions? I'm just going to start by just making a comment here, and that is all the money that we have spent on our highways equipment. We have spent, that's right, these figures are correct, we did spend 100000 bucks. we paid $50,000 for a considerable amount of equipment, we spent $50,000 upgrading it to a municipal standard, the stuff's in better shape than we've had in years, and but the key to that is, is that we've done it all within the costs that we would have spent on the current, uh, if we had just extended the contract at the old rate. 
we are actually going to end up with a surplus this year can we end up doing a better job than jim payton i don't know we're going to try we may not are there going to be complaints this is much chosen everybody complains <laughs> but we're going to do our best but the bottom line is is that we couldn't be certain anybody could do as good a job as jim payton but again, I just wanted to make it clear, yeah, we spent that money, but it is money that we would have spent anyways on the current contract, and, and we would have spent more than what we have spent in total so far. I just want to end by giving some thank yous here. First of all, I want to thank my current council. I want to thank them for, the, for their hard work, their imagination, the good humor they showed, their readiness to explore new ideas, and, and, but more, most importantly, the respect that they've shown of one, one another. It's been, a, it's been a real pleasure in this term, so thank you, Council. I also want to thank the residents here. Again, this place is rural because the residents care. They come out to, to meetings like this. 30 seconds. 30 seconds, okay? The volunteers, again, are huge in this community. And I actually want to thank people like Ed and Gail and people who come to the council meetings and hold our feet to the fire. That's, uh, that's an important function in a democracy. And I guess one final thank you, and I see him right there. That's my campaign manager, Andrew Watson. I want to thank him. He represents the new generation of young people in this community that love this community, that know how to keep it, and I expect people like him and those other young people that we see there up here sooner rather than later. Thank you. Not too much to say. I just want to thank you all for coming tonight and listening to what I have to say. Please look at the numbers. I'm not in a numbers game, but I know in 2009 you paid the contractor $441,000. Nothing flat, we've already spent $342, $622. Once for the whole year, the other just for a few, few months. So there's something wrong here. And I know what it is, being in business myself. This gross deal will kill us. The taxpayer is going to take a hit like he's never seen before. It'll be akin, it'll be akin to the DNB lands, where I have heard a few numbers mentioned. If the DNB lands are sold, Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Have a good night. I'd uh, like to thank you folks for the engaging questions because, uh, as I say, I don't profess to know all the ins and outs of what goes on in the chosen, but tonight I was a fast learner. If elected to council, I'll endeavor to bring fresh eyes and a fresh attitude to council. Uh, I will do my best to ensure that all the chosen aides are treated in a fair and equitable manner in and out of council chambers. I'm not asking you for your vote, but please vote. Thank you, good night. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to uh, thank my staunchest supporter, my Andrew Watson, who created incredible confusion because both Andrew Watson and my Andrew Watson went to the same dentist. And... <laughs> but anyways, uh, I think the best way to end tonight is with the answer to the question that the Times columnist asked me. What are the best things about your community? My answer is the people. We may disagree on some issues, but I believe that we all want the same thing, a place that we are all proud to call home. Thank you and good night. I've often said that the last three years on council have been the worst of my life and also the most exhilarating of my life. And I say, if you want to be loved, go buy a dog. Don't <laughs> <you>? <laughs>
Don't, don't run for council in the chosen. <laughs> Even on a good day, you're going to please 50% if you're lucky. So, for you aspirants here, I wish you luck. But don't come into the here with your, with your eyes closed. But it is, like I said, an exhilarating experience. And I thank the people who voted for me, both of them. And, <laughs> And I hope uh, that uh, you'll judge me on what I've done the last three years, or probably the last ten years in Machosen. And thank you for coming out tonight, and please talk to your friends and get you out to vote. We were the, the second highest percentage at the last election. We were 54.79. Unfortunately, the uh, Highlands were 70%. But they've been acclaimed this year, so there's nobody, there's no percentages. So with a couple more people out, we can be number one. So please, get out and vote. Thank you. It's like, thank you all for coming here tonight. And just um, to explain a little bit more, somebody, uh, the question we had to answer earlier was, how did we decide on the details of the detached secondary suites. And I did tell you that it was all a lot of, after a lot of long discussion. I thought I should quote to you saying from Ogden Nash that a camel is an animal designed by a committee. <laughs> so you'll understand how, how we reached our, our decisions. No, it's just, it's just that there was a lot of long, hard discussion to get to where we did. Um, and a lot, of give and take, a lot of give and take on part of everybody. That said, um, I would like to say that three years ago I posed a question. That is, does this old girl still have enough energy to get all these things done that I want to get done? I would certainly like to give it a go and it's up to you. <clears throat> Thank you. Once again, thank you all for coming tonight and caring enough about your community to come out in this awful weather and uh, listen to us up here and hold our feet to the poles. Actually, I wish it was a little warmer down here. A few more colds would have helped out. Um, I don't really want to waste this last minute or so talking about me. Um, what I would like to say is that the direction and stewardship of this community actually rests with you. Um, no matter who you vote for or how your next council behaves, it's up to each of you to take personal responsibility for looking after your neighbors and for looking after the social fabric of this community. And it's up to you to protect the land that you live on right now. As we all know, uh, bylaw enforcement isn't a really strong suit here, so it's up to you to care for where you live and how you live. Um, there's a over 850 species we counted at the BioBlitz that share this place with us. And all of them deserve to still have a home here. Um, I can do a job of looking after the dollars and cents if that's what you want me to do. And uh, I'm always going to do my best for the environment. But ultimately, it's up to you to put support and protect all the values that make this such a special place. So in closing tonight, uh, thank each of you for coming this evening, for being active, for being engaged in your community, learning about who we are and why we want to be serving you either again or for the first time. I'd like to thank uh, the Chamber, Stephen, for moderating tonight. Thank you very much for a great job. To the young people that are in the room and for the young people that are in your lives, yes, please, get them up to this table at some point. It would be nice to be joined. Twelve years ago, I had an opportunity to stand here as a 21-year-old. I was very green at this. I really had no idea about what I was getting into. But once I got into it, I loved it. And I have stayed with it for the last 12 years. I thoroughly enjoy my community. I thoroughly enjoy giving back to my community. And I would be honored to be able to do that again with another group of amazing people here in Machosen, on Machosen Council. So thank you again for coming this evening. I hope you've had a good time listening to us. 
Uh, please read our literature. If you've got neighbors that don't normally vote, take them to the polls. It is really, really important that we do this. Bring young people in your lives out to the polls. Get them educated. We've got three more days before you have to make that decision. Thank you very much for coming tonight, and I hope to be able to see, serve you again soon on council. Thank you. Uh, once again, thank you all for being here tonight. To all of those who, of you who have helped me in the past and in the future, I would like to give my sincere thanks. I would like to give my personal and sincere thanks to Mayor John Rands, Councillor Morley Milne, Councillor Joe Mitchell, and Councillor Tremblay for their support through this last term. It's been a pleasure. But most of all, I'd like to thank my wife, who puts up with an awful lot. I couldn't do it without her, but please join her on Saturday and vote me in for my fourth term. Thank you very much. Well, there you have it. You have a couple of days left to think about it. And I just want to say once again, you're very fortunate to have the caliber of candidates you do have. It's been a pleasure to host this, and thank you for turning out and supporting your community. Have a great night. And good luck with whoever you vote for. Good luck to the candidates. And I hope you don't stop getting being involved in the community just because you don't get elected, because there are going to be people who don't get it.